Hi guys, I'm back with another RKPCB repair. Today on the bench we have this non-working Atari Dig Duck board, a classic arcade game from 1982. I would really like to get it working in my universal cabinet, that would, <laughs> would actually be great. I got it uh, off eBay and um, the auction already stated that the uh, board was missing one IC, which is this one over here, otherwise uh, everything seems to be uh, complete. Uh, the board does have some custom ICs, unfortunately, which tend to be um, uh, in a rather bad shape or uh, let's say um, the uh, legs of those custom ICs um, tend to corrode uh, uh, very much. Mm. We will have to figure out if we have to deal with that or how to deal with that. Um, I actually, before I bought it, I already looked uh, what kind of chip is missing here. Uh, I at first thought it could be another EEPROM, but what is actually missing here is a RAM chip and um, luckily not a custom chip, so the RAM chip can of course be replaced. Um, but maybe uh, before we uh, start with anything, um, I already hooked the board up to my uh, test setup, so let's just fire it up, see what it does. And then, you know, go uh, through the step-by-step -step repair process. Um, and, uh, well, yeah, hopefully the game will be running at the end. Okay, here's what the game does at the moment. You can see some kind of garbled graphics on the screen. And there's a ticking, kind of a ticking sound coming from the speaker. Um... Well, the first thing uh, that is uh, obvious is we would have to put the missing RAM IC in. And uh, fortunately, I already uh, purchased one uh, on the web. I looked up in the um, schematics what kind of RAM chip was missing. And I already have it here. So uh, as a next step, of course, let's put the RAM chip in and see if... Um, the game is getting any better. I actually doubt that it will be running. It would be <laughs> kind of too easy, but let's just check. Okay, and here's how the game looks uh, with the RAM chip in place. So we actually, I think we actually have a new layer of graphics on the screen. We still got um, some uh, garbled uh, items on the screen like we saw before, but we got a sort of a text layer. Uh, but which is also glitching up, which we didn't have before. Uh, well, that is uh, the situation at the moment. Uh, what we can say is that uh, what it comes down to is basically uh, a CPU problem because we have uh, some graphics on the screen, we do ha have some sounds. The game is obviously watchdogging, uh, which uh, means that it is resetting over and over because it is not running correctly. So we need actually need to troubleshoot a CPU problem on this PCB, basically. Uh, we do have, in this case, we have three uh, Z80 CPUs on the board. I think this being the primary CPU um, of the game. Uh, this being the secondary, I think, for the sprites. And this maybe being the third uh, CPU for the sound. But we will have to check uh, in the schematics, um, actually. Um, looking at uh, CPU problems, you know, it's always a step-by-step -step approach of things that you need uh, actually to look into. Uh, what are actually the possibilities or the possible reasons for um, a failure like this? So the first thing would be that the CPU itself could be bad. So the game isn't running because the chip itself is non-working. 
Uh, second uh, possibility would that it has a, would be that it has a, a bad connection. So maybe the CPU socket um, is corroded, or maybe um, like in other videos that I did before, some legs uh, are actually bent and they are not really making uh, contact in the socket because somebody took the the IC out and put it back in and um, bent some of the legs in the process. That would be the second uh, possibility. The third possibility would be um, a problem with the signals that the CPU actually requires to run. Of course, it needs power. Of course, it needs a clock signal. Of course, it uh, needs a reset signal to actually uh, process uh, the program as it is supposed to. And um, fourth uh, possibility of a problem is that um, it actually has a problem communicating with its uh, ROMs and RAMs because the CPU can't run on its own. It will need access to ROM chips and it will need access to RAM chips. The ROM chips storing uh, the program for the CPU and the RAM might need, uh, uh, need to be required for the CPU to actually work as a working uh, RAM. Uh, so, of course, the ROM chips could be bad. The ROM chips content could, uh, could be wrong. Um, the ROM chips could have bad connections. Um, same goes uh, for the RAM. So RAM chips could be bad. RAM chips could have bad connections. And also, as the last possibility, uh, there is Actually, on every PCB, there's uh, a certain amount of ICs that actually connect the CPU um, to the RAMs and to the ROMs. Uh, they are not directly hook, hooked up, so, uh, but there are some uh, ICs in between, which, um, you know, depending on what the CPU uh, wants, uh, wants to do at the moment, if it wants to read from a ROM, if it wants to write to a RAM, it has to activate those chips and, you know, it has to... Uh, <clears throat> the connection have to switch to that IC. So there is some uh, multiplexing, some decoding uh, uh, going on. And this all, all uh, has to work, of course, also. So those glue chips, as they, uh, they are sometimes called, because they glue all these, uh, the RAMs, the ROMs and the CPU together, uh, might be problematic as well. So if we go through this list, through this long list, we'll probably find the problem with this game and we'll probably be able to fix it. So uh, it's a you know, structured approach to a very basic problem. You know, the headline of this problem being um, CPU, uh, CPU error or CPU not running. Okay, so I just uh, started the troubleshooting and I was actually um, just removing uh, the uh, CPUs uh, from uh, their slots and checking if uh, the legs are okay. They actually do seem uh, to look uh, pretty good and uh, there doesn't seem to be any problems uh, with the sockets as well. Not any signs of corrosion really uh, or anything. But um, what's very interesting, this is I guess the secondary CPU that I just uh, removed from the PCB. If you look what the, uh, the game does now at the moment, you can see this. So we still have the uh, glitching letters layer, but now the game is actually telling us something. It's, uh, it says uh, RAM zero high, probably. So the game actually tells us uh, that it has a uh, problem talking to the RAM. Uh, very interesting. Those um, old PCBs do have some capabilities of uh, self-diagnostics. Um, and the primary CPU is probably telling us at the moment that it cannot, that it probably wanted to talk to this uh, RAM uh, chip, which it calls zero high, and uh, that uh, this uh, wasn't possible, so it displays this error message. I would actually assume that um, this error message was there before when I had the, uh, when I had this, um, this CPU, uh, still in place, but it probably was uh, hidden behind some other uh, garbage graphics. So this is uh, already some clue 
we should actually look at the uh, manual of the game and try to find out what this uh, what this uh, actually means or what uh, zero high what kind of ram chip on the board this uh, error is corresponding to and uh, well we could look specifically at that ram chip then okay so looking in the games manual which you can find on the web and on cloth you can actually uh, here see something about those error messages and it says we are the one we are having is uh, ram zero high um, and the bad ram chip location is on the game pcb is listed here so if it is ram zero and or ram one it is basically uh, location 9m and if you look on the board where that is well these are the uh, letters this is m and we have um, nine the nine over here we are ending at this position ha so guess what the brand new ram chip that was missing or the the chip that was missing and was replaced by a brand new one by me just a minute ago is uh, supposed to be non-working well i don't really think so but this actually explains why the chip was missing i think uh, somebody else actually um, came across this error message before maybe this person took the old ic out threw it away put a new one in game still didn't work so maybe the, they removed the new one and just put the board in the shelf that's kind of, uh, that's how it normally goes you know so um i'm assuming that this ram chip should work because it's new um so um well, what can we uh, de deduce from that? If if the CPU says that it has a problem talking to this RAM, um, this not does not only only mean that the RAM chip chip must be bad, but of course there's other chips that, uh, like I said before, that are uh, those so-called glue chips that are connecting uh, the RAM to the CPU. So. We actually would have to look into the schematics uh, and see uh, what other ICs are actually involved if the CPU wants to talk to this RAM. And uh, all of those uh, ICs as well could be uh, the cause of the problem because um, the CPU actually can't decide uh, if it cannot talk to the RAM if the, this is the case because the RAM chip is faulty or missing or if any uh, major uh, other chip surrounding it, which is switching the, the address or data lines to the chip, uh, has a problem, you know, the, the CPU will never be able to discriminate that. So these uh, uh, other surrounding ICs are uh, also in question. So uh, let's look at the schematics and find out what those other chips might be. Okay, so in the schematics, we see the RAM chip here. There are some address lines uh, going uh, to the RAM chip, of course, and some data lines, enable lines, and also uh, read-write signal. So what we are seeing on this page uh, is that actually for the RAM to, to work, uh, we would also require this IC, this LS245, which is a I think bidirectional buffer. Uh, we would require this one to work, which is the IC at position 8M. And also at uh, position 7H, we have this, um, what is it, a NOR gate, I think, um, LS08. Uh, this would, of course, also have to work. So 7H and um, 8 M seven H. So this guy here would have to work as well. And this guy over here next to the RAM would be the uh, multiplexer, which would also be required for everything to work. 
So, but there's more pages of the schematics. <coughs> so, more chips in question. Let's just look what else we can find. Okay, well, as it looks, this is pretty much it. Um, this is the uh, first priority CPU. And it's um, outputting, uh, or it's connected via the um, address bus, which is called AB, 0 to 11, and the data bus, which is called DB, 0 to 7. And this bus pretty much goes through um, to uh, the uh, RAM chip and also the uh, third priority CPU and uh, also second uh, priority CPU um, are connected to the same bus. So um, they actually share a common access to um, um, some of uh, the uh, chips uh, as it looks and uh, also the, the RAM chip in question can probably be accessed by all three CPUs and there is some um, uh, to switch um, between the CPUs or to uh, regulate the access so that not all the CPUs are talking at the same time on the bus. There's a certain bus controller or several bus controller chips um, which are custom ICs. I hope that they are uh, not the problem, of course. But uh, the RAM chip seems to be uh, pretty much uh, directly uh, uh, connected. Uh, you can see here that uh, the address bus lines are directly connected to this to those uh, PA lines, which maybe is Playfield address, and uh, those are going into the um, into the uh, RAM chip directly. Um, yeah, which we can see here, and the others are the data bus lines that we saw on the uh, CPU page. So. Well, not much uh, circuit involved, just those uh, three ICs and uh, the bus controllers. So um, maybe uh, we'll uh, take out the logic probe and just uh, look at the uh, signal situation uh, of those ICs here. Okay, so I just uh, actually did check uh, all the legs of uh, this RAM chip and uh, pretty much everything is toggling. So there's activity all over the place. Um, that is a good first indication that there is not really a connection problem. But uh, as we um, had we talked about it before, in other repairs, you cannot really troubleshoot a RAM chip with a logic probe, uh, especially if it's uh, if it has to do with um, graphical data for the screen, because it will actually, no matter if it works or not, it will actually be, uh, you know, read all the time by the uh, video circuitry, and it will output whatever garbage is it has. So. Uh, which leads to uh, some sort of uh, wiggling lines. Uh, in any case, um, well, yeah, also this uh, logic chip does have all wiggling signals going on. So this does not actually help us that much. So what we could do next is actually um, take out the fluke, put the fluke in into the position of the uh, primary CPU. And then with the fluke, we could actually try to talk to the RAM over here and see uh, what happens if the RAM can be uh, contacted, if it can be read if it can be written, uh, that would be a very interesting thing uh, to see, actually. So, well, yeah, let's uh, hook up the fluke. Okay, guys, so I hooked up the fluke 
Uh, I removed uh, all three, P three uh, CPUs from the board actually. And uh, here's what this uh, actually looks like at the moment. You can kind of see the, uh, the game screen, you know, even without any um, CPU in the game, actually. And, um, well, I was looking at the um, schematics and service manual and I found out that this RAM chip um, is probably the 2K Playfield RAM. It's a two kilobyte RAM chip and it is accessible by all the CPUs actually uh, through this address, 8000 to 87 FF. And so I got to my fluke and um, I did a I did a RAM test and I tested from 8000 to 87FF and what it says is that on the first uh, address that the fluke tries um, to inspect there's um, actually a, an error with um, this is like the bit code of the error. So the second bit of the uh, higher nibble, so it is, if this is, uh, you know, the lower ones is one to four, then this is five to eight. So bit six actually of the um, RAM data or of the RAM chip um, has some sort of a problem according to the fluke. And if you now, for instance, um, look into this uh, manually. Uh, we can, for instance, go to the beginning of the RAM, address 8000, and we can write uh, a, a value of FF. Fluke says OK, so if we read it back now, it says FF, so that is good. Um, if we look, for instance, at 8001, we have a value of 20. Um, if we write an FF to 8001 and read this back, we get the FF. So we do seem to be able to write. So, but now here comes the problem. If we write A value of zero and read that back we don't get a value of zero but we get a value of 20 um, and if we write for instance something like zero F and read that back we get 2 F so uh, you m might get the pattern here. So the second bit of the higher nibble always wants to stay high, no matter if you write a zero or a, a one at this location. That seems to be the problem. And that also goes uh, for the rest um, of this RAM area. Um, other parts of the RAM are actually okay. There's a different RAM starting at 9000. This is zero. If I write an F, um, if I write an FF nine thousand, and now uh, if I now read this, I get an FF. If I write um, a zero at nine thousand, I now get a zero. So this actually works. So there seems to be a problem with uh, particularly this uh, RAM area where one bit seems to be stuck high. So we now need to investigate how that can be the case or what, what could be causing this problem.
Okay, guys, I just found something very interesting and it has to do with this uh, buffer chip over here. If we look at the uh, schematics again, uh, we did already uh, notice that this uh, buffer chip is connected to the RAM and that it actually uh, it's a bi-directional buffer so it uh, connects um, it, it can be used to either connect the data bus to the chip uh, so that uh, data is being sent through to write to the RAM or it been, can, be, uh, can be used to connect those uh, uh, two buses to be able to read from the RAM that is the uh, direction bit uh, down here and uh, I was just probing on the uh, data bus side of this IC. Um, so we can look at the data that is supposed to be coming into the RAM. So if we now look at those lines with the um, oscilloscope, so This is um, data line number eight, for instance. It's, uh, this is number eight, this is number seven, six, four, five, and so on. It's a 20 uh, leg IC. So this is uh, data bit eight on the data bus side. And at the moment, nothing is going on because the fluke is the only, IC, uh, the only CPU connected and it's doing nothing at the moment. But if I tell the fluke now to uh, write to the RAM, for instance, a, a zero, zero, and then of course the fluke only does this once, but I can also let the fluke loop this command. So this light is blinking. So he is now uh, writing 00, zero to 8000 again and again and again. So and while the fluke is doing that, we can look at the data that is coming into the um, that is coming into the RAM through this buffer, and we can see here. Oops, sorry. Okay, so we can see here that there's basically a high signal which has some low pulses, uh, which is the data that is going to the RAM. So it's a zero, zero, so there's a zeros going to the RAM. Uh, I'm now going through all, the, um, through all the bits of the data bus on the uh, on the uh, buffer I see and I'm seeing the sign same signal everywhere. So the CPU wants to write zeros to this IC and actually the, the zeros appear to be arriving on all data lines at this uh, buffer chip. That is a good thing. Okay, so and if we now, now it gets interesting, if we now read at 8000, we get the 20, which is wrong. We wanted to get a zero because that's what we were writing at the address. And we loop that, so the fluke is repeatedly reading from address 8000. And we now look at the data lines. So we look at line number eight. We get this signal, which is pretty much looking like it did when we read, uh, ex excuse, me, excuse me, when we wrote the signal. So this is bit uh, eight of the data. So this is bit seven, looks pretty much the same. Now here comes bit six. And bit 6 looks like this. That looks different, doesn't it? I, I will continue to bit 5, which is this one over here. And bit 4. Oops, sorry. Bit 4. 
So by looking at the oscilloscope and repeatedly reading from the address 8000, after having written zero into it, we can actually see the value of 20 that the fluke is uh, reading back here on the oscilloscope because we see that this line is outputting this and uh, this is interpreted as being always high because there are, uh, there are some smaller flanks, signal flanks, which are going down from the high signal, but they are not reaching um, to, the, uh, to the zero, to the ground level for this particular bit. So that's the interesting find that we have. So we can tell that the data that is going into the chip is uh, correct. Um, but what is coming out of the chip is problematic uh, at, um, at least at uh, this location on the buffer chip. Okay, and if we now um, also look on uh, the um, on the other side of the buffer, on the RAM side, the signal looks like this. This is, it, this is much um, higher frequency. This is the output of the RAM and the higher frequency has to do with the uh, uh, video output circuitry and the generation of the picture on the screen. The low frequency is just the fluke which is write, write, repeatedly writing at a low frequency. But um, we can see that the I'm going through the bits right now, we can see that they actually all look the same. So it appears to be the case that the RAM chip doesn't really have a problem to get the uh, sixth uh, data bit to go low. This was an enabled signal, I think, just. Um, they are all identical. So, well, what it comes down to is that this uh, I see is probably faulty. For one moment, I also thought maybe there's just something on the CPU side of the data bus that is pulling this uh, data line low all the time. But uh, that wouldn't, if that were the case, um, we wouldn't really be able to explain how um, the correct values will be written into the uh, RAM and also probably other RAM locations like 9000 etc on other RAM chips wouldn't work also. So I think this, um, this buffer, bidirectional buffer chip uh, has a problem uh, with, um, with the bit 6 where bit 6 is actually forced high uh, on the, uh, at least on the direction uh, going to the data bus. So this is the, the best guess I have at the moment. So um, also those LS245s uh, have been bad before on other repairs. Uh, I have to say I do have some in stock because they seem to fail very often. I don't know really why that is the case. But um, well, this is our best shot, I think. So I will uh, remove, uh, I will unhook everything, remove this IC, put a socket in and um, actually replace the IC or maybe uh, test it in my IC tester and see what we get. Okay guys, let's um, I just unsolder the uh, IC from the uh, PCB and if we put it in the tester It says, uh, the tester says that it cannot detect uh, what kind of an IC that, it, that is. So it is an LS245. I have another LS245, uh, which is a new one, unused one. If I put this in the tester, the tester says 245 found. So this IC might really be bad. That would be great. 
So I will put this replacement IC in the PCB and we can we will see what we get. The new um, IC is now in the PCB. I added a 20 pin IC socket and um, I uh, put all the three uh, CPUs in, the primary, the secondary and the uh, tertiary. I think, is that, an, is that an English word? I don't know really, but the third CPU, so to say. And um, I fired it up already. And um, well, unfortunately, um, even though we found a problem and uh, I think we did fix it, um, uh, the game still isn't running. So um, <clears throat> The first thing to do now, I guess, would be to uh, double check uh, if we really uh, fix the problem and, um, you know, reconnect the fluke um, to the CPU sockets and check maybe even each and every one of the CPUs um, again if they can actually talk to the RAM and if they now can uh, read uh, and write uh, read from and write to the RAM correctly or if there's still uh, somehow uh, remaining or the same issue. Okay, I just uh, started removing the uh, CPUs. This, I started with the secondary CPU and um, actually I wanted to look at the error message again and it uh, actually changed uh, uh, the error message it before it said RAM zero high now it says uh, RAM zero low so I don't know that's a kind of a different error message the board is displaying at the moment and I'm really not sure why um, the board doesn't want to show me the error message if the um, secondary CPU is in place I mean that can't be how it is meant to work you know so um, I'm somehow uh, suspicious of the uh, circuit that uh, that involves the secondary CPU. Maybe there's also another problem, but uh, well, let's go ahead as planned and reconnect the fluke. In the game's manual, I just looked up uh, the error messages um, again and um, well, as it seems, uh, we used to have the RAM zero high um, message and now we get the RAM zero low message, but they seem to uh, relate to the same uh, IC. So I guess it's still kind of the same problem. I don't really know uh, what those um, numbers are uh, referring to, if it's different uh, parts of this two kilobyte uh, chip, I don't really know. Um, yeah, but let's let's just uh, check out um, the how the accessibility of the RAM looks like at the moment. Okay, so I uh, connected the fluke to the uh, primary CPU socket, and uh, well, let's just um, test as we did before. Let's read at eight thousand. At the moment, this is. 48 okay so if we write at 8000 and ff and we read it back we get an ff this used to work before but if we wrote a zero we always received a 20 because one bit didn't wasn't able to be pulled down low but now we get a zero so this works so we can do actually do a ram test of the RAM region 8000 to 87FF, which would actually correspond to the uh, whole range of this uh, RAM IC. Uh, this uh, normally always takes a moment. Uh, Fluke says wait over here, so it is still um, finishing its job. But uh, if there are any errors, it would actually interrupt uh, the process and show the error message. So this is already a really good sign that it is taking so long. Yes, and it says, OK, so the RAM is completely uh, accessible now, at least for the primary CPU. 
Yes, and uh, one thing we can also do um, to check if uh, the CPU is connected right is uh, to check if it ha has actually access to the um, program ROMs. And um, to check that, we would have to do a, a ROM check with a fluke. And we can, um, you know, uh, check the uh, checksums of certain ROM regions. And uh, well, all of the three CPUs have their own ROMs. You can hardly see it here, but yes, this is the socket for the primary CPU. And those four chips here are the EEPROM chips for the primary CPU. Uh, the secondary CPU is this, and those uh, are the two EEPROM chips directly connected to it with program code. And uh, same goes for the third uh, CPU here, which has its single uh, program ROM uh, over here. So I actually looked at the uh, main ROM collection and I calculated uh, checksums uh, for the EEPROMs, like we did in earlier videos before. And uh, those are the four EEPROMs. Um, that are uh, related to the uh, primary CPU. And uh, I could already uh, see that the uh, EEPROM start at, um, at uh, memory address zero. And I think um, each EEPROM has um, like uh, 1000 um, hexadecimal bytes uh, range. Uh, so this range would be the first EEPROM and we would ex expect a signature for the EEPROM 6218. So we can run this test. Um, so the fluke is now reading the complete EEPROM and calculating the checksum. And the fluke is verifying if this checksum actually turns out to be 6218. Mm, this is actually very handy. Oh, and it says OK. So the first EEPROM is OK. And if we want, we can check for the second two. And the other ones I can do off camera if they are okay. Um, so um, 4290 would be the checksum for this region. 4290. The re region is like uh, the first one was from 0 to 1000 practically and this is from 1000 to 2000 and so on up to 4000, um, that is the area of the uh, program code for the primary CPU and says okay also, okay so let me just do the other ones off camera. Okay so all the uh, four EEPROMs tested out fine, so no problem there, so the primary CPU can talk to, to the EEPROMs, can talk uh, also to this RAM chip, read and write, everything's great. So I switched the fluke over to the secondary CPU and um, I'm doing a ROM test there for the secondary. The first, it, this only has two EEPROMs, so it's only half the address range, but starting also at zero. Um, and the uh, checksum for that would be 8895. And when we do that, it at first looks good because it is um, probably reading, but then it says something interesting, address error at 8000, uh, excuse me, at 800. So at first I didn't know what the fluke wants to tell me. Why would there be an address error or what, what does the fluke actually mean by address error? Um, so he's, he's going halfway through the, uh, the first EEPROM, practically exactly halfway, and then he says address error. And uh, what I could have done earlier, actually, if I uh, would have done it by the book, was uh, to do a bus test. 
on all of the CPUs. Um, this is a test that you can, if you connect the Fluke for the first time, it's always a very good thing to do because the Fluke can detect problems with the data and address bus if there are any, uh, you know, um, influences on the on the signal lines which prevent the bus from uh, working correctly, the fluke might be able to detect that. And uh, if we do a bus test, then the fluke says that he noticed that address bit 11 is tied low. Um, address bit 11 is tied low. So the address um, lines are uh, actually only being driven by the CPU itself because the CPU um, uh, sort of um, uh, tells the rest of the PCB uh, what it wants to do and uh, which parts of the, CP, uh, of the PCB need to be addressed at the moment. So uh, nothing else on the uh, PCB is actually driving um, the address lines except the CPU if everything is uh, working correctly at least um, and the fluke says uh, that if he the fluke wants um, to actually put a high signal on this 11th bit of the address line that he actually can't because something on the PCB uh, is actually pulling the line uh, to ground obviously so it can't be uh, pulled high and uh, therefore um, the uh, CPU running in that socket or the fluke uh, neither will not be able to uh, address uh, certain um, address areas uh, obviously the address areas where the 11th bit of the address line uh, needs to be uh, pulled high uh, to reach them. So um, we did have this error message when we wanted to check uh, the first EEPROM. So it uh, stopped at uh, the address of 800 and it said address error at 800. The problem was that if uh, the fluke wants uh, to set up an address of 800, the 11th, that, that is exactly the moment when the 11th uh, data bit would have to go from a low state to the high state, which uh, obviously isn't possible because it's tight low. So what can be the cause of that? Well, either there's an IC on the address line that is pulling um, pulling the line low because it is malfunctioning like we had with the uh, buffer chip up here sort of or what, what could also be possible of course is that there is a an actual short on the PCB so that are that there's uh, two traces on the PCB uh, which are connected or to be more precise uh, it might also be possible that somehow the ground um, uh, the ground uh, plane uh, on the uh, PCB uh, could maybe uh, be uh, connected um, through some so uh, to, through some short or solder drop uh, to the 11th uh, address line, uh, which prevents the CPU, the secondary CPU, from working correctly. So. I think uh, we shall uh, disconnect the fluke and uh, expect, uh, inspect the, um, the PCB if we see any, uh, any signs of a visible short. Mm, and if we don't, we should check uh, what, um, what ICs and what circuitry are uh, actually directly connected to this address line for the secondary CPU. Okay, so the um, address line 11 is actually pin one of the um, CPU. So it's the the most uh, upper left uh, pin right here in the picture. And um, uh, on the schematics, uh, I could see that it is just connected to, to one IC, which is this guy over here, which is another uh, buffer chip. It's a it's a different one. It's a uh, mm, 74LS367, and you can actually see if you do a, a continuity test that 
this pin is connected to this um, to this buffer IC, but also, uh, which is interesting, if you um, uh, check the resistance uh, between uh, the ground plane and um, uh, yes, uh, this IC, you can see that um, uh, the address line uh, 11 and the ground plane are actually only 40 ohms apart, so to say. Um, that is pretty much a short. It's not a dead short with, with a solder block on the board, but uh, it's probably a short, um, you know, through the through this IC, uh, if it is actually the only IC uh, which is uh, sus suspicious here, well, but um, well, here you can see it. Um, over here we have the secondary CPU. Those are the address lines. Uh, the one, uh, uh, the one up here, A11 pin one, is actually apart from being connected to the EEPROMs, um, it is only connected to this, um, to, you know, to this buffer chip. So what we actually could do to double check uh, that the EEPROM chips aren't at fault, which might be, uh, might be uh, um, something to look into also, we can, as they are socketed, we can remove those chips uh, from the board and uh, thereby uh, out of the equation, so to say. And we can uh, can then see if this is uh, still our main suspect. Okay, also when I remove um, those EEPROM chips uh, from the board and I measure the pins on this uh, buffer, I still get uh, a very low um, a resistance to ground uh, for the uh, pin which is um, belonging to the signal line um, A11. And also very interesting, um, there are some other address lines that are going into this IC which is, uh, you know, address line 6 through 10. And if I measure those against ground, I don't get any uh, measurable uh, resistance. So I get uh, an infinite value. So another case of a problematic um, buffer chip, I would say, um, uh, at least um, it is again very likely. So what uh, would have to be done is that I remove uh, this guy um, also from the uh, PCB, put another uh, socket into the board, and uh, well, when the when this guy is off the board, we can then check the resistance between um, you know ground and A11, and uh, uh, if this is an infinite value, then we uh, have our culprit, I think, and we would need to replace uh, this uh, guy here. Okay, so I. Um, uh, did uh, remove the IC, um, which was this uh, IC here. I did put a socket in and I already measured uh, the uh, resistance between, you know, pin 2, which is address line 11, and ground, and it is, um, uh, you know, uh, indefinitely high, so there is no more connection uh, to the ground uh, plane at the moment, so the connection was actually through this IC. Um, uh, well, yes, additionally, uh, the removed IC actually just failed my uh, digital IC testers test, so uh, looks promising. I hope if we replace this guy, uh, we get some of the game uh, to run, actually. Okay guys, uh, just replaced uh, this IC here and when we fire up the game, unfortunately, we still seem to have problems. So we have actually two uh, issues solved so far with uh, some blue chips interfering with the uh, data and address bus. 
Mm, but still, um, the game isn't really running. Um, one thing I already checked is uh, if uh, all of the three uh, CPUs can now talk to their EPROMs and to the RAM chips. And this actually just uh, tests out uh, just fine. So all three CPUs um, can talk to their EPROMs. Primary CPU is talking to those four. Uh, secondary CPU is talking to those two. Uh, tertiary is talking to this guy. And all the checksums for the EPROMs uh, test out fine. Uh, also, the connection to this RAM chip is okay. And there's a, a bank of six other RAM chips here, uh, which is for the motion objects, uh, I think, uh, and some other stuff. Uh, all of the CPUs can talk to those as well. So you could actually think that the game should be doing something more than just this. So there still must be some issues with the board, obviously. Okay, so one interesting thing is, uh, I think the game is actually uh, supposed to kind of look like this when the game is starting up. So you at first, for the first second or so, see a screen uh, with letters. Uh, and then you see some, you know, some sprites moving on the screen. Uh, some more graphical, which looks like glitching uh, in this corner here. Mm, and then normally there's the black screen which tells you RAM OK, ROM OK, and then there's a test grid, and after that the game starts. So there's a certain startup sequence to the game. And this actually kind of looks like what uh, the, start, the regular start sequence would begin with. with some uh, screen with, uh, you know, flashing letters and those uh, green and blue um, squares uh, in there. Um, it's kind of okay, but what we can uh, s uh, still uh, notice is that the game is uh, watchdogging, so it, which means it is actually resetting every second or so. So it's it's looping and it's, it's flashing like bop, 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 bop. So it's continuously uh, resetting itself. Yes, and that is because of the watchdog circuitry that is on the board. And what the watchdog does is, uh, it mainly consists of um, a counter. And the counter is, uh, you know, counting up uh, through some um, clock signal on the PCB. And if it reaches a certain value, it will reset the board. And what is the point of that? Well, um, the watchdog is normally, during normal operation of the board, is being reset by the CPUs. So the value of the watchdog counter is being set to zero from time to time, so the board does not reset. And if the CPUs fail to reset the watchdog, then um, the watchdog will restart the game. So, and the purpose of that is, if the CPUs have some problem, and they are, are crashed, for instance, then they won't be uh, resetting the watchdog, and the watchdog will therefore restart the game, and get the CPUs to run again, maybe. So this circuit actually is intended so that if the game is uh, standing in an arcade, um, there's, not a possi there's no possibility that the game is actually crashed in the arcade and it's standing there and nobody is there to reset it or anything. So the watchdog in that situation would actually do that automatically. So at the moment, the watchdog is, uh, you know, um, restarting the game over and over and therefore we cannot really see what the game would do if the watchdog weren't there so maybe it could uh, you know as this first screen looks promising maybe we could see if it uh, does something more if the watchdog uh, weren't resetting it all the time but um, yeah, on the PCB, I just uh, discovered something when I looked at the schematics about the watchdog. There's actually a, a, you know, a small contact point on the PC, PCB, which is called v WDDIS. And I think it, it will be, it will mean watchdog disable. And if I ground this, you know, if I put a wire on this and I put, um, 
another wire to to this crown pin then the watchdog will <coughs> actually be uh, disabled okay and now that the watchdog is disabled and is not resetting uh, the game so the game is frozen at the moment we can actually restart the game uh, using the reset button on the PCB Oh, and actually, this this kind of looked like the startup sequence of the game. You get this sprites here, then the the running uh, the 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 main game, game character walking in those uh, diagonal lines, and then uh, there's another RAM failure. I don't know why the screen is upside down at the moment. Okay, but we get, we get a bit further actually. Um, and I'm actually asking myself if the PCB can, uh, well, you know, it, it obviously still doesn't start, even with the watchdog disabled. But if the, uh, obviously, the PCB is running for a moment and it's doing a, uh, uh, the beginnings of, you know, the start of the self tests, and so it is showing some. You know, background, some of the motion objects, etc., etc. Why is it is the game still watchdogging? Why <coughs> don't the CPUs prevent the watchdog uh, from barking in this initial moments when they are running uh, correctly? Uh, probably. So that is a question we should actually look into the circuit and look where the watchdog signal is being generated and maybe see if there's also a problem in that area. Okay, in the schematics you can see that the watchdog signal um, is coming from this uh, address decoding part for the CPUs. Uh, you know, it's this uh, WDDIS uh, signal uh, right down here. And this is coming from an LS138 uh, on position 3B slash C, which should be um, right this guy over here. Okay, so what this whole page of um, schematics uh, seems uh, to do is that um, actually through address lines, several address lines and data line zero um, the CPU is able or the, all the CPUs are able to evoke certain signals which are coming out here out of the circuit through a certain address so they can reset the game they can uh, reset the uh, watchdog etc etc um, through this circuit by addressing a certain address and we actually um, saw this at, at the beginning in the uh, memory table I think because there's also you know some addresses uh, like for instance uh, yeah here it is the watchdog reset so any CPU can write to this address 6830 and then uh, the watchdog should be prevented from resetting the game, you know. Um, also other signals here, other addresses, reset IRQ1, reset IRQ2, enable NMI3, etc, etc, reset third, uh, second and third Z80 CPUs. All of this stuff is possible through those, um, you know, addresses. Okay, so let look, let's look into this uh, circuit here. Okay, so now checking the IC that is responsible for the watchdog disable signal. Uh, I could just see that, uh, you know, pins one, two, three. Uh, okay, they are actually the inputs to this decoder. Um, they are all toggling. Uh, I can show you maybe right here something which looks like this. 
and we have uh, you know signal lines um, four, five, and six, which are also doing something mostly high but intermittently low. This line, for instance, um, they are okay, I would say, and they are actually. Uh, toggling in a way that this um, I see should be decoding and outputting some stuff. Uh, he basically doesn't. It's actually hard to tell just with the um, logic probe or oscilloscope if it is working right because you never know um, how the timing is of um, the output enables and the uh, address lines uh, that are going into the chip so if it really uh, is supposed to pull down a certain line at a certain point of time very hard to tell um, but um, what we can see here this is the uh, this is one of the output lines the watchdog um, line is 10, 9 10 11 12 let me check. Okay, so this is what the watchdog um, disable signal looks like. Uh, so it is a, a high frequency intermittent signal, which is good, which uh, would suggest that the IC actually wants to disable the watchdog or reset the counter of the watchdog. Let me check again, 9, 10, 11, 12. So yeah, that is the signal. But... Uh, this of course won't work with this signal because this has just a signal height of I think you know it's two yeah it's one point maybe eight volts or something so it's probably being regarded as permanently low and the next output here looks like this also I don't know 1.5 maybe volts in the high state you can see that there is um, you know some baseline and an elevated uh, height but this is not enough to be uh, to represent a high signal so this will be seen as low all the time also and particularly this uh, signal here is uh, probably important for all the other decoding because um, it's uh, this signal line here, which is going to the next step of the, of the decoder ICs and is used as an enable line. So as a consequence of that being, that signal being messed up, all the decoding that is going through here and all the signals over here um, aren't working as well. And uh, also, you can see there's a signal from this IC going on into those two, which won't work. So in pretty much all of the, these signals uh, on the right side aren't actually working at the moment because uh, this IC uh, appears to be out of order. So I, I guess we found another uh, problem problematic part on this PCB. And <laughs> I think that is, this is kind of getting out of hand. I uh, didn't actually think that this PCB could have so many bad chips, but it actually appears to be the case. All the chips that I removed so far had a certain degree of corrosion on their legs also. I don't know if this has something to do with it. But well, I hope in the end, I will probably, after replacing this guy, um, we will probably find some more problems, but uh, at least we seem to be um, advancing through the repair at least the board is doing more than it uh, did in the beginning so I still have hope for this PCB okay so now after replacing this IC with a new one we can actually see what the signal is looking like uh, for the uh, watchdog for instance so it's a high signal which is intermittently pulled low and I already removed, um, you know, the watchdog disable leads uh, that I had in place here. And, you know, I already actually fired up the game in the hopes that this uh, game might be fixed. But now I'm getting a new error uh, message combination. It says uh, RAM OK uh, and ROM 7. Uh, ROM 7. Uh, according to the manual and also uh, to the uh, print on the ROMs, it's probably this 107 
is uh, the EEPROM that is connected to the uh, third of the uh, CPUs, which is probably the sound CPU, I guess. So I don't know why it's actually giving us this error because we already checked all the CPUs for their uh, ability to access uh, the ROMs and we all checked uh, for the proper uh, checksums with the fluke. Well, <clears throat> it's getting <laughs> kind of difficult here. I think I will um, actually reevaluate the access of the uh, tertiary CPU to this EEPROM and see if uh, anything might be wrong actually with this EEPROM. Okay, so I got the flute back in position. And um, yes, I just wanted to uh, reevaluate uh, the connection to the EEPROM. And I started with a, another bus test and the bus test says okay. Um, and also, um, I already tried to uh, recheck the checksum of the EEPROM and it was okay. But um, one thing I noticed, actually by dumb luck, uh, if I'm honest, uh, if you repeat the bus test several times, here you can see it, it sometimes says address bits 4 tied. So 3 and 4 tied, okay. So sometimes it says okay and sometimes it actually says okay mostly 4 but sometimes also 3. So there seems to be another uh, actually another bus problem here. So let's take another look at the schematics. What is connected to the uh, to the address bus or to the lower bits of the address bus of the tertiary CPU? And uh, let's look at the board. What uh, what might be going on here? Okay, as you can see in the schematics, the uh, the lower address line bits from um, address zero to address five are actually. Um, directly uh, connected to um, uh, to another you know buffer chip another LS367 we had a faulty one of those already so maybe this guy at position 7M um, also has some issues okay so I replaced another uh, logic IC uh, at position 7M, another buffer chip for the um, lower address lines of the tertiary CPU. And uh, well, let's give it another try. Oh, did you see that? It said RAM ROM OK. Oh, that looks. That looks good actually, so maybe the game's finally fixed, I don't know. Let's check if it is running, actually. Okay, it looks like it won't coin up, really. Well, yeah, it did. But let me just hook up the sound. Uh. So maybe we have some sound as well, I don't know. Okay. Oh. Oh, nice. Looks like it is working, huh? Oh. Oh, no. He got me. <laughs> okay, but that's great. Well, I guess I let it run for a while, you know. This board had so many glitches. But it looks like it's finally working. So interesting. I really actually thought that maybe I wouldn't be able to fix this PCB because, you know, 
all these uh, CPU and address line problems um, and, de and uh, you know, uh, decoding problems seem to be uh, too many and um, um, you just uh, couldn't get a real oversight of the problem, but of the problems that uh, were going on. But I think now uh, everything actually turned out all right. All those, you know, custom ICs made me really think that we might get into a problem here, but actually I touched none of them. And uh, yeah, everything seems to be working now. So watchdog isn't firing anymore i already mentioned that because we fixed this guy here too yeah well just resetting retrying if it will boot up another time and still work but yeah i think okay that was the coin up yeah so seems to be working great very nice okay so great success I would say in the end uh, might be a longer video uh, if I um, you know put it together actually but uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it and uh, yeah so don't be uh, discouraged if you have a PCB that isn't working that has many you know, custom ICs uh, on it, which you might not be uh, able to replace, but uh, sometimes uh, you're lucky, as you can see here, and it's just uh, other basic components failing. So, well, great. Uh, thank you very much for watching. And um, yeah, please uh, like and subscribe my videos and uh, my channel. And um, well, yeah, thanks uh, again and see you in the next repair video. Okay guys, and before we end the video, I just put the uh, game into my um, universal arcade cabinet uh, to have a little uh, play. And um, also, uh, what I wanted to show you at the end of the video, I have a little uh, footage of the original Dick Duck um, arcade machine in all its uh, original arcade glory. Um, early this year, in April, I actually visited um, uh, England together with my son and we went to the arcade club in Bury and uh, we had a lot of fun uh, playing the games uh, in that arcade. Quite an impressive collection uh, actually of classic and up-to-date uh, arcade games. And uh, I do have uh, some more footage of our visit at the uh, Bury Arcade, so maybe I'll uh, post that uh, later on the channel. Uh, but for now, um, uh, let's look at uh, the original Dick Duck machine. And again, thanks for watching and see you in the next repair.